Speaker's program. Today we have with us a uh, very controversial, famous columnist. His uh, column appears in 160 newspapers about four times a week. He's the creator of the State of the Nation column in the Christian Science Monitor. And today he's going to deal with uh, some of the affairs of the world and the affairs of the nation and try to dwell on the new Nixon administration. Gives me great pleasure to introduce Roscoe Drummond. Thank you, Richard, and fellow students. I've asked for a shorter uh, podium because it's so tall that uh, uh, my chin hardly comes over the top. And while I just as soon talk to you from behind a curtain, it just seemed a little unfair to not be able to see me over the top of the, of the, the podium. So he's going to bring something a little shorter. But in order not to waste any time, uh, I, would, uh, I thought I would just start in on an informal basis uh, my thought uh, was to make our discussion today just as informal as possible, and I thought I might sort of turn it into what we might call a presidential press conference in reverse. You know how three or four hundred of us uh, meet with the president about once a week and have for many years uh, and uh, seek to put the president on a spot, and uh, I thought perhaps you'd like to put a Washington columnist on the spot, which is where many people feel he ought to be anyway. <laughs> Uh, uh, so that uh, I'm going to ask myself a few questions to start with, maybe the easier questions, and then submit myself to cross-examination. Now, I don't want to appear too virtuous. Well, a little virtuous, but not <laughs> too virtuous. Uh, uh, but I do say that uh, no holds are barred when it comes to questions, and I know even if I hope that they might be barred a little bit, uh, uh, you wouldn't uh, be responsive to that anyway. But it, it's only candid, it's only being candid with you, and probably I won't use this anyway. Uh, it's only being candid with you. Uh, would you rather have me stand up or so I, I Everybody says that is two, and that's a majority with somebody. Uh, one is, I believe. Uh, uh, Nobody's going to play God, though. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be candid if I didn't say that I have myself attended approximately 18 or 1900 presidential press conferences since, since I went to work in Washington uh, in 1940. And uh, just by watching these political artisans at work at the, at the organ, of the presidential press conference, it's just inevitable that a Washington correspondent would acquire, perhaps through osmosis, uh, a certain capacity to deal with questions without answering them. <laughs> now, the questions I thought I might touch upon, and I'm going to, uh, you watch time, will you, for me, so that uh, uh, give me five or eight minutes uh, uh, so that uh, we do have time for questions. But I thought that the, uh, the questions that I would... Uh, oh, I think I'll use that. That looks better up there now. Because I've got both a... Uh, I've got both a... <coughs> something to stand on and... Uh, I can see you and... That's an asset. Now, if, the, if this mic, is this mic uh, strong enough for everybody? Can everybody hear as much as they want to? <laughs> the questions I thought that I would deal with uh, are these. And uh, I may answer some briefly in order to uh, leave more time for questions. What kind of a man do we have in the White House today? And do we really know him? I was going to comment, I shall reserve comment. <laughs> uh, what are his priorities in his purposes and what is he put foremost that he wants to do? Uh, will there be early U.S.-Soviet arms talks and have the, the prospect of being productive? What are the lessons of Vietnam? Uh, uh, 
what are the uh, uh, prospects of getting a peace settlement out of the Paris peace talks? And finally, are the universities on the way out? <laughs> Now, it is to me a rather interesting fact that Mr. Nixon has matured in public. And uh, we, some people say they don't know Nixon, or is there a new Nixon, or is this the old Nixon with a new suit? Uh, Actually, uh, he's been visible to us uh, for ever since 1947. And uh, unlike many of us, we haven't had to exhibit our painful growth toward maturity in public the way he has. And uh, uh, I am inclined to feel that uh, while I don't hold with the idea that there's a new Nixon any more than there's a new Marx. Uh, because we are the outgrowth of what we were before. And uh, uh, I'm inclined to feel that Nixon is thus far proving himself to be a far better president than he was a congressman or a senator and a far better president than he has been as a candidate. Uh, uh, both in 60 and 62 for the governorship of California and uh, in 1968 uh, uh, when he uh, affirmed that no fourth-rate military power like North Korea uh, would be allowed to uh, perpetrate a flying Pueblo. And yet, Mr. Nixon had the growth and the grasp and the sense of responsibility of the President of the United States to eat his campaign oratory and to uh, uh, choose to serve the national interest rather than to slavishly become the prisoner uh, of uh, his campaign statements. Now, I think that Nixon is proving to be candid in his press conferences. He is uh, uh, open to dissent. He is conducting a remarkably open presidency. And uh, uh, I think he is aware that no president of the United States can function effectively if uh, he loses credibility with the American people. And Mr. Nixon intends to retain his credibility, and I could give you two or three uh, examples of that. For the first time that I can remember, a pre the president, a president, announced an increase at that period, several weeks ago, of casualties in the Vietnam fighting, American casualties. You don't ever remember Mr. Johnson telling 40 or 50 or 60 million Americans about casualties in Vietnam through the press conference. Well, this uh, Mr. Nixon was recognizing reality, and he was he was he was establishing his. Uh, uh, his credibility and his candor. You may remember or have read about or your parents have told you about in 1947, uh, uh, 48, 50, in the early, early 50s, Nixon was one of uh, uh, the uh, coldest of the cold warriors, as it were. And yet, I almost slipped off the edge of my chair at a White House press conference when I heard Mr. Nixon explaining to the American people why it was difficult to expect, why it was unlikely, unwise to expect and difficult for the Soviet Union to uh, uh, desert an ally like North Vietnam. That, that we could, it's easy to say, 
Russia could stop the war in Vietnam by, uh, by stopping uh, the flow of, of armaments to North Vietnam. But Nixon wanted the American people to understand that that's not the kind of decision which the Soviet Union could take, even though the Soviet Union may want to see a negotiated settlement. Now, that is another example of the, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Mr. Nixon's credibility, his maturity, and the third uh, example uh, would be uh, uh, the fact that unlike uh, President uh, uh, Johnson, for whom I had, who, who uh, did many valuable things as president, in my opinion, I take no slighting view of the total record uh, of President Johnson, uh, but uh, when uh, President Johnson announced uh, the uh, planned deployment of the ABM, he didn't announce it. He chose his Secretary of Defense to announce it. And he sent his Secretary of Defense to San Francisco to make the speech 3,000 miles away from Washington. And yet Mr. Nixon announced uh, uh, his decision in favor of limited deployment of uh, an American ABM to match limited deployment of the Soviet ABM. He announced it himself. He didn't let anybody else do it. He announced it at a nationally televised uh, White House press conference. Uh, and again, uh, he was uh, uh, demonstrating his outspokenness. I, I think that on balance, I would say that Mr. Nixon is making a better beginning, far better beginning than uh, uh, his critics expected, and uh, in many ways better than many of his admirers thought that he would. His press conferences show a real grasp of uh, affairs, a, a, a real three-dimensional knowledge and understanding of the operation of the federal government. Uh, he's done his homework. Uh, his press conferences uh, are responsive. Uh, he, uh, he answers questions. Uh, he doesn't filibuster. He doesn't plant questions. Now, I raise the question of Mr. Nixon's priorities. Uh, I think his priorities are these, and I will put them to you. Uh, number one, end the war in Vietnam as soon as possible, it, within terms that he believes uh, uh, will make uh, uh, a durable peace. Two, avert war in the Middle East. Three, begin early negotiations with the Soviet Union on the crucial opportunity to reduce the perils and the costs of the nuclear arms race. There's no doubt that this is high in the President's priorities. I'm sure negotiations will begin uh, uh, shortly after June, May, May. It'll certainly begin early summer. And uh, uh, I think that at least we are at the moment when, if ever, it is possible to reach an agreement between the two superpowers in the whole area of arms control and arms reduction. Both sides, I believe, want it. Both sides have reached a point where the military balance between the two countries is very near to equal, and this is, is the special and precious opportunity to achieve it now, or maybe kick it away for a very long time. And the fourth priority is that uh, the President is determined, because he believes it crucially in the national interest to get inflation under control. And he believes that this is a vital requirement that will be beneficial to everybody, not to any particular group 
in the country. Now, these are priorities. I think that the tendency in recent years uh, has been not to have national priorities. And I think we've gone through a period in which uh, the federal government has undertaken a little bit about so many things that nothing really solid and significant has been accomplished in the whole range of uh, our most critical domestic problems. And I think what Mr. Nixon is saying is that these things have got to come first, that unless the war in Vietnam can be settled, the prospects of doing what is needed in the whole range of domestic problems is very slight. And that with the settlement of the Vietnam War, the it is open to the, uh, to the nation to do most anything it wants to in the whole range of, dom of critical domestic problems. And uh, somehow I think it is better that the president is not pretending that everything can be done at once. Uh, but is candidly stating that first things have got to come first and uh, that everything cannot be accomplished overnight. Now, I want to talk a little about Vietnam and something about whether the universities are here to stay. <laughs> there are some, it's probable, I suspect, that uh, what I'm going to, my views on Vietnam will not parallel uh, the views of everyone in this room. I used to believe that uh, I, lie. I think it's still true. I think that I try to put more time into, re into mastering and pondering views with which I'm likely to disagree with than I am pondering and uh, subjecting myself to the views which are parallel to my own. So I'm hopeful in the climate of the university that uh, 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 you may be interested in a point of view that might uh, be uh, uh, contrary to uh, uh, the dominant view of this audience. Anyway, I have a feeling that there's a tendency to some extent in the country today to feel that why not let the peace of the future go hang in Vietnam and let's get out regardless of the consequences. Now, I happen to believe that we're witnessing an increasingly open demand in Congress and in the country for a kind of peace at any price, and that they hope to exert sufficient pressure upon President Nixon so that he will give in to anything that Hanoi asks. Now, I I believe that the President of the United States wants to end this war just as soon as possible. He seeks disengagement. He seeks to de-Americanize the war. He is doing many new things to make it possible for South Vietnam, for South Vietnam to take over more of the responsibility in its own defense. But he does not propose to end the war at the price of a fake peace. I think that Nixon wants American and other foreign troops out of South Vietnam just as rapidly as possible, but not in a way which discredits the word of the United States when it comes to the defense of another country uh, because at least three American presidents concluded that the defense of South Vietnam was related to the defense of the United States. Now, I'm not going to uh, 
develop that point at length uh, unless you want to develop it in questions. Uh, I do feel that uh, uh, that the need to reject the peace at any price approach to the Paris negotiations concerns whether we're going to be able to end this war under terms that will make its renewal unlikely and it will prove a stabilizing influence for all of Southeast Asia. And secondly, I believe that the character of the peace that develops from Vietnam uh, will greatly affect the future foreign policy of the United States. Many people talk about the need to learn the lessons from Vietnam, and I think there are many to be learned. And then they debate on how the nation can use its power more wisely to serve the cause of peace in the future. Now, I believe that events and not words are going to determine future American policy. And the most controlling single event which will shape the future United States policy will be the shape of the peace in Paris. I believe that if the United States deserts the cause of a just peace in South Vietnam, that it will be doubtful if a future ally or an adversary will be likely to believe our word on another occasion. And I say, can the United States expect to be a deterrent against aggression anywhere in Europe or the Middle East or in Latin America if we come to the defense of a nation when it looks easy and quit when the going gets rough? Now, the question is, are is the president doing anything? What's the president doing to promote a settlement in Vietnam? Well, I think he's doing a number of things, and I will list them to you briefly. He is definitely rejecting any hasty retaliation in response to the repeated but now declining Hanoi attacks on the cities of South Vietnam, which was part of the mutual understanding which made it possible or made it acceptable for President Johnson to end all the bombing. Nixon is making it clear that there will be no resumption of the bombing except under far greater provocation uh, than has and manifested itself so far, and if I were to offer a judgment, I would say that the prospect of uh, a resumed bombing is, is simply not visible to the naked eye today and is not going to take place. He has helped persuade President Thieu of South Vietnam to reverse his previous refusal to negotiate directly with the Viet Cong, and that's all to the good. He had Secretary of State Rogers announce publicly in Washington recently that the administration was not was seeking a peace not through military victory, but through a political settlement. And the president has cut back two uh, B-52 bomber raids in South Vietnam by 10 percent. He calls it an economy. It's a minor economy, but yet it is a symbolic gesture on the part of Nixon to reduce uh, the uh, uh, level of fighting in South Vietnam. These are the things which, uh, Johnson, which uh, Nixon has done, and uh, he believes, as stories over the weekend indicate, that uh, uh, they are already moving the discussions toward private talks, which alone are likely to bring concrete results. These private talks have not yet reached the point where they are product productive. Uh, now, I want to add one more point here. 
the NLF, no, I'd like to put it this way. I think we ought to take into account, we ought to be aware that at this stage, the government of Saigon and the government of the United States have already gone much further toward accepting North Vietnam's conditions for peace than Hanoi or the VC have gone toward accepting ours. The NLF demands that the elected government of South Vietnam be disbanded as a condition of settlement. Saigon doesn't demand that the NLF be disbanded or that the government of North Vietnam should be disbanded, although it never has been elected, but agrees that the NLF can participate in the political processes of South Vietnam. The U.S. has already accepted three of the four points Hanoi laid down. One, early withdrawal of U.S. forces either whenever the conflict is significantly reduced or when Hanoi does the same thing. We, we, there's a great deal of talk about unilateral withdrawal. Uh, I think talk about unilateral withdrawal is a tremendous liability to uh, the negotiations in Paris because it simply serves notice on uh, Hanoi that if it waits long enough, uh, a divided American opinion will coerce the president to give uh, Hanoi whatever it asked. Uh, therefore, that reduces, that slows up the prospect of uh, negotiation. I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the coming months we did witness some symbolic unilateral uh, withdrawal. And this may be the key to agreement, uh, to, uh, uh, to action, if not agreement because it's entirely possible that Hanoi does not wish and will not agree to mutual withdrawal of, of uh, non-South Vietnamese forces from South Vietnam because it doesn't want to admit it's ever been there. Therefore, the solution may well be a symbolic withdrawal of American forces to be matched without any agreement by a symbolic withdrawal of North Vietnamese forces and to be followed in successive stages of first one withdrawal and then the other uh, rather than a formal treaty agreement to that effect. Now, the United States has accepted these three Hanoi conditions for peace early withdrawal of U.S. forces if Hanoi will do the same, neutrality for North and South Vietnam as provided in the Geneva Agreements, reunification on the basis of popular wishes, and finally the U.S. has not approved Hanoi's demand for an unelected coalition government in, Sa in Saigon as a part of a peace treaty. It favors free elections open to the NLF candidates. Uh, I think that is uh, more than a, a minor earnest uh, of our good intentions. I do think that, uh, as I said a moment earlier, that uh, the uh, uh, that uh, the demands in Congress and the uh, uh, rising pressure within the United States to push the president into precipitate unilateral withdrawal is holding back potential success in Vietnam. And uh, that because uh, uh, the Saigon is, is in Paris today because it reached the conclusion that it couldn't gain its objectives by defeating the United States and South Vietnam in the battlefield. Therefore, it uh, decided to negotiate, and naturally, it is, seeks to achieve by negotiation what it was unable to achieve by war. And uh, therefore, 
whenever the south whenever hanoi can see the probability that a sufficiently divided america will give hanoi what it wants by waiting it's going to continue to wait indefinitely and therefore uh peace is not likely to come until it is clear to hanoi that the president is that uh, until one this pressure declines or two it becomes clear that president nixon is not going to yield to that pressure my own judgment is that a beginning has been made and i wouldn't be surprised to see one substantial diminution of the fighting in the coming months a significant symbolic withdrawal of us forces to be matched by a similar withdrawal of uh, uh, North Vietnamese forces. And uh, uh, I know the prevailing judgment in Washington anyway is that the prospect of agreement in uh, 1969 is considerably high. Now, I did want to say a little something about the uh, state of what is called euphemistically student unrest uh, and I wish to I wish to identify my prejudices immediately whether you can believe it or not I consider myself to be pro-student the only thing I'm against is resort to violence. I think the students in all of the claims and demands and goals and objectives which have been put in different ways on different campuses, I think more often than not, the students are nearer right than those who have been resisting them. I think that, and, and uh, uh, I want to deal a little bit with what President Nixon had to say the other day. Uh, uh, he talked about backbone. Well, I'd like to go into that a little bit to see what he meant. Some students meeting at many, no, some faculty members, perhaps not as responsible as the majority of students, uh, rushed to prepare a resolution criticizing the president without even, and uh, secretary and, and uh, the attorney general without really, without ever having the opportunity to read the full text of, uh, of uh, Mr. Mitchell's statement. When I was in college, I was always told the thing is to go back to primary sources, to read the evidence before you reach a conclusion, and not to take what somebody says uh, about uh, the evidence. Read the full text. Don't read a, only a news story about Mitchell's speech. Read the speech. Uh, in fact, the almost impeccable Bruin today. <laughs> We're directing all of you to a different room. You, uh, saboteur, no doubt. <laughs> or else he was doing you a favor. Anyway, I want to say to you that I think that President Nixon was very right in calling upon administrators, faculties, and trustees to meet student dissent with responsiveness and flexibility. Those were his words. And to meet student violence with backbone. The headlines mostly talked about what the president said about backbone but if you'd read if if everybody had read fuller into the story maybe on page 17 or had read the full text of the president's speech you'd have seen that he was strongly endorsing the need and the right and the propriety and the value and the wisdom of students having larger voices uh, in a whole range of uh, university decision making not taking over the university, not assuming students who are here for two years or four years or five years 
uh, would have the continuity to run the university, which they wouldn't have, but larger voices uh, in the whole uh, uh, range of this decision making. Uh, I believe that, uh, uh, the, that students should have a larger, much larger role in the whole range of campus rules and student discipline. Uh, uh, I probably would, if I were a member of the faculty or of an administration, I wouldn't think that college students should uh, pick the professors. But I do think it would be a capital idea for students to have a regular opportunity and an instrumentality for evaluating and rating the professors confidentially so that the administration of a college could have the benefit of student judgment of who were the real teachers and not just the researchers. Now, I want to look briefly at what the president was trying to get at the other day. Was he talking about putting down dissent? No, he wasn't. Was he talking against giving students a larger voice? No, he's for it. Is he disdaining the deep concern of students for peace, for the quality of their education, for the quality of our society? I think he wasn't. He knows that this concern and the presence of this concerned generation in the nation today is healthy, is needed to make society better in this country. What he was saying in effect was that capitulation to force leads only to further demands backed up by force. And that is intolerable. I think that Nixon was rightly saying that administrators and faculty must have the backbone to cease capitulation to force or else knuckling under to it will become an endless cycle which will destroy our universities and undermine our free society. That's what he was saying. I believe that the president's appeal should apply equally to the, to the students who need backbone too so that they may join in the resistance to uh, destructive violence. Because by their silent assent, some students, if not many students, give disruptive minority, minorities most of their power. They don't possess the power of their own numerical strength. They possess the power through the silent assent of other students. I believe that what is most needed is to draw a clear line between civil rights and civil wrongs. And I'll be through and ready for questions in, three, in two or three minutes. I suggest that it is not a civil right to carry guns to settle academic issues. It is not a civil right of a minority or even a majority to shut down a school to prevent others from attending classes. It is not a civil right to burn a library, to wreck computers, and to destroy files. It is not a civil right to seize a building, to halt the administration of a college, or kidnap a dean, or drag a college president from the microphone. And I add that it is not a civil right to disrupt It is not a civil right to disrupt a class because a professor's views are unpopular with a minority, or even if they are unpopular with a majority. Here's what happened at Cornell recently. Militant black students were showing up for classes they had not registered in, taking seats in the rear, and carefully jotting down the professor's words. The message to the faculty members 
any remark that might in the slightest way offend sensibilities could only invite trouble. This is the kind of denial of academic freedom. This is the kind of denial of uh, the right of intellectual independence. This is the kind of effort to impose uh, uh, teaching opinions upon the faculty, which I think most members of the faculty and most students are afraid that maybe a governor of California, if I could remember his name, uh, maybe he hasn't got such a political future as we thought, uh, uh, which many fear is what he would like to uh, have prevail uh, on a campus. And when you have uh, 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 students uh, participating in that kind of repressiveness, that is alien to our free society and alien to our university. These are not civil rights, they are civil wrongs. And I suggest that a university that keeps its doors open on the basis of concessions to violence is not a university, it is a mausoleum in which the pursuit of knowledge, free inquiry, and the life of reason have been interred. And that is the process and the end result of yielding to that kind of condition. I believe change is crucial. And if we have a concerned generation, I believe that the concerned generation should represent the animate, determined, articulate activity and conscience of students who want to achieve change short of resort to violence. And I believe deeply that it is open to you to achieve it. And therefore, I stress that change is negotiable, but that violence is not negotiable. Now, if none of you, if some do not have to go to classes, I'm, I would be delighted to take questions. We start right over here. Well, uh, I would put uh, the, the, I'll repeat the question. The question was, uh, how do I know that the talks are going to take place uh, this summer? Uh, uh, my first answer to the question is, I don't know. It's a judgment. Uh, it's my opinion. Uh, I think there's much evidence to back it up, but uh, as, as to certainty, no. Uh, however, there's, t to me, there's ample evidence that both sides want to talk. Uh, uh, President uh, Johnson, for two years, tried to get the Soviet Union to agree to begin talks on uh, how to halt the, arm, the whole range of uh, the nuclear buildup. And uh, uh, in the last three months of his administration, uh, Johnson was successful in getting definite word from Moscow that they were then ready and willing to begin talks. Uh, it is rather suggestive to me, maybe not conclusive, but suggestive, that the Soviet Union announced its willingness to begin talks about five days after President Johnson endorsed and announced plans for uh, the uh, deployment of the Sentinel ABM. So in this instance, at least you have evidence that American deployment of the ABM, designed to match Soviet deployment, which is much more extensive today than anything we have, uh, far from being a deterrent, may have been an asset in getting talks 
beginning. Now, it has taken this administration three or four months to review the whole negotiating position of the United States. That may seem a little long, but uh, I don't fault the president on that. This is a crucial question, a complex question. Uh, there was uh, a new head to the uh, uh, Arms Control and Disarmament Agency appointed uh, after William Foster resigned, and it has taken uh, from February and will be into June before uh, uh, this administration will feel that uh, it uh, is satisfied with uh, past negotiation, past negotiating positions, uh, or will have altered some of them. Uh, and uh, uh, both Mr. Kosygin and President Nixon have stated that they want to begin negotiations as soon as possible. That's my answer. Yes, please go right ahead. Oh, oh we'll come back to you. Go ahead. It's always dangerous, isn't it, to make assumptions? Right. I have the question, uh, and I think it was audible to everybody, and I will offer the basis for my assumption. Uh, uh, of course, yours is an assumption, too, in my opinion, but uh, it's certainly arguable, and different points of view uh, are honestly held by different people. Uh, many of these characters that you mentioned, I've been most critical of for many years. Jim and uh, the government before and immediately after. And I think that maybe it is only fair to say that South Vietnam is in the process of becoming a nation. South Vietnam is, of course, as much a nation as North Vietnam. South Vietnam has had elections, and North Vietnam has never had elections because the communists don't believe in elections. That is, uh, elections which give you a choice uh, between parties and between candidates. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, what the United States is doing is trying to secure the right of the people of South Vietnam to have a government of their own choosing. And we have made s significant headway in one election, and I would say that as a result of a peace settlement, further elections to give the people of South Vietnam to have a government of their own choice would be forthcoming. Please, go right ahead. Yes, right over here. How, how do you justify? I read about two years ago uh, a man called New who ran his peace candidate against Chu, who was thrown into prison last summer because he gained a considerable amount of support. And I've been reading in the last few weeks how the government is closing down papers that oppose Chu. Uh, this does not seem to be, to be the kind of democracy we're trying to achieve. One, I agree with you. I think those are 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 those are grievous flaws in the process of this country to begin to achieve uh, a better political system. Uh, uh, actually, there were many Americans of many points of view who, who, were, who went to Vietnam during that election and certified that it was a substantially equitable and fair election. 
I would suspect that probably the prospect and the substance of, uh, of a meaningful and fair election uh, was as great in many districts uh, of uh, South Vietnam as in Chicago. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but Mr. Nixon didn't ask for a recount in order to keep President Kennedy from being inaugurated. Yes, go ahead. I do not feel it my duty to justify anything that I think is evil in South Vietnam because I think we're seeking to develop a situation and an opportunity to make something better. Oh, uh, I didn't get the question. Did, oh, is it in the national interest? Uh, yes, I, I, I understand. Uh, I think I uh, have felt that it was. I can, I, I, I can see a very honest, I, I, I can well believe that if we had it to do all over again, we might not do it. But nevertheless, uh, uh, I do think that we, it, I do believe that we will find that if we stand for an honorable peace, the whole prospects of a more stable, a more secure, a more productive, a more prosperous, and a more peaceful Southeast Asia will emerge than though we let it, than though we throw it away. Uh, you, yes, right over here. Uh, I have the uh, suspicion that our country believes that it's right to negotiate from a position of power. And this is the reason that we're not withdrawing troops unilaterally from Vietnam. We believe negotiation from a position of power or force or violence, uh, as you have it, is a uh, proper path for this country to pursue. And yet you say that you don't feel it is right at any time for the students to assume violence as a method for pursuing their goal. Now it seems that this country has fought now for a, a half of a century uh, since World War I, which was the war to end all wars. Uh, World War II, which I assume was the war to end all the wars from now on, and now and then Korea, and now Vietnam. And we're working towards a position now where we'll assume force so that we can show uh, future aggression uh, that they have no possibility of beating us. So we negotiate from a position of power, and yet it is a moral wrong, as you say, for the students to do the same thing. Do you think that it is a moral right for the students to use force in violence? I think that the students are getting their moral leadership from their government, and this is something that Richard Nixon said. But I haven't, uh, I haven't seen much evidence that uh, the uh, principal practitioners of violence on the campus have much confidence in the leadership of the government, and I don't think that they're taking their views from the leadership of the government. Now, I'd like to, to, to address myself briefly to the question, because I understand where it leads in its nature, and it's, it's, a, it's a common view that is widely held by, by students and others. And uh, uh, I, belie I, I believe that if you're going to say that uh, violence by a nation, or the use of force by a nation, under any circumstances, would justify the use of the resort to force by individuals against law in a government which provides uh, uh, for peaceful redress of grievances, is if this is a valid comparison, then I think you have to conclude that uh, uh, no resistance to attack under any circumstances, because uh, uh, the United States did not uh, uh, go into uh, uh, the World War II until uh, Pearl Harbor. And so the United States was attacked in World War II. Of course, I think it is in many ways as honorable, if not more honorable, and more moral to defend what you believe is against an aggression than it is to defend against an attack. Uh, but 
I, I feel that if you're going to make that equation, then you have to logically follow it out and say that uh, we must never defend ourselves. And uh, I think that would be at least an impractical and imprudent policy. You, you choose me. Right back there. Well, I hadn't realized myself that Britain has the capacity to stop that war. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilson has uh, uh, gone to Nigeria, uh, and I didn't see any significant uh, uh, accomplishments. Now, m my, my conviction is that the United States would like to stop this war and would like to use any legitimate means short of uh, resorting to what you wouldn't want the U.S. to resort to, uh, uh, to bring it about. And of course, there's tremendous efforts and tremendous public support for uh, uh, helping to meet the terrible famine and hunger in Biafra in the United States as well. Please. Surely. I'm sympathetic with the idea that the United States ought to exert its influence and its power to just ends under such circumstances. I think most of those who are most critical of Vietnam think that uh, we ought to quit feeling that we have a stake in these things all around the world and, uh, and be awful sure that uh, we don't take any great risks. You, you decide. You. Right back there. You. Yes. That's right. I think that there are many people in different parts of the world, uh, usually the farther away they are from the problem, the more certain they're right, uh, and the less able they are to influence the course of events in Vietnam, it's awful easy to give advice. I remember in the 20s and 30s, before the United States accepted responsibilities around the world, our, 
our political leaders were giving advice to France and Britain and Germany and everybody all over the world because his advice was awful easy to give because we couldn't do anything about it anyway, so it was at least safe to give advice. Now, uh, uh, I believe that, uh, what, what, was the, what was the center part of your question? Would you state it to me again? Oh, yes, I follow you. Yes, uh, uh, I feel that, uh, that uh, there are those who uh, honestly believe that an aggression hasn't taken place. I find it hard to reconcile that with the facts, but there are those who honestly believe that. But uh, uh, I still, f I, I deeply feel that most of the, uh, I certainly I've talked with virtually all the leaders of the nations of Southeast Asia. I've been to Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore and the Philippines and Vietnam and Thailand, and I know that nothing would create a greater sense of, of anxiety and, uh, and, uh, and uh, fear than for the United States to precipitately leave or for the United States to say, well, look, any old peace is better than, than staying under any circumstances. Uh, I have a feeling that, uh, that uh, once having made the commitment to defend, if we run out on it, 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 it will make it much harder in the future for the United States word to be a deterrent. Um, Certainly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe that the only, I, I, I believe that there's only one central condition which the United States, and I think this is shared by Vietnam, South Vietnam, uh, requires is that there be uh, supervised free elections in which the Viet Cong and the National Liberation Front can run candidates as long as they do not resort to force. And that therefore, whatever the result of that election, we're going to have to abide by it whether we like it or not. Uh, I, I, I'd like to add one thing, and that is I think at least all the people that I've considered knowledgeable about South Vietnam uh, conclude that while uh, there is a great deal of splinterization in politics in South Vietnam, there's a very small minority that wants to uh, be governed by communism. And therefore, uh, I think this is, is something of a risk, but I think it's a proper risk, and I think we should accept the results of free elections. And I think we would. But how can you get elections with communist and non-communist and leftist so strongly divided that taking part in an election unless you do like the South Vietnamese Well, uh, they're turning in their weapons to conduct themselves in an election which they contend they believe they can win. From, from everything they've said about their political strength, this should be, this should be duck soup for them or else uh, they don't believe what they say. I think we have time for about uh, two or three more questions. Why don't we take the one in the back? in which uh, candidates were all allowed to visit 11 districts. 
Every candidate was given government money to visit 11 districts, but there was only one candidate that was allowed in the ballot who was known throughout the country, and that was President Xi. This was the situation in Vietnam, and although we had people there supervising the elections, granted Americans were there supervising elections, uh, I was there at the time, and the majority of people in South Vietnam, the majority of the South Vietnamese that went to the polls, didn't know the people on the ballot. In very many of the districts, the local person who was known, you know, the, the one who visited those 11 districts, won out over President Xi. Will the gentleman yield? The majority on the Northern vote. Right. Uh, I would like to say that I think that the conditions of voting would have to be exactly the same for North Vietnam and for South Vietnam. I don't believe that Ho Chi Minh permits any South Vietnamese to run for office in North Vietnam, and I think that only South Vietnamese will be eligible to run for office in South Vietnam. Now, if President uh, Ho, if Mr. Ho Chi Minh would permit President Thieu to run for president in North Vietnam, I think there might be a good chance that Ho Chi Minh could run in South Vietnam. Do you think that the United States and President Nixon would allow a nationwide election throughout Vietnam today? I don't think Ho Chi Minh would. He's never allowed free elections or free campaigning. I think that's quite true. What we're talking about is elections in South Vietnam. Well, now this is, this is a basic question. Sure. From the point of view of the North Vietnamese, there is not really a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam. Well, they, they, uh, the, the, this, was, uh, uh, this was an, an arrangement which was worked out in Geneva. Right, and the arrangement was for reunification in 1960. Yes, and each side will have a right to vote on that and should have. And That, that's why I'm in favor of elections. Why don't we make this one the last question? And this will be the last answer then. All right. In viewing your comments on campus unrest, I agree with you, first of all, the forms of violence. Right. I think you're missing the point of right. why this has occurred. There are issues on campus which students go through the legitimate channels for, and we're doing things here. I can give an example later. And one obtains a standard bureaucratic runaround. You get nowhere. You try the, the legitimate democratic processes, whatever you want to call them, and you get nowhere. This is the reason the violence comes on. You want an example? Uh, most campuses, if you take a poll, we have conducted polls here, you find the majority, the out and out majority of students in favor of abolishing ROTC. And yet, when you take this to the administration building, it's impossible. We can't do anything. We, we're not, we have no power over it. Or in essence, we're not going to do a damn thing. What resort does one have then but to pushing harder, pushing harder, which ultimately leads to some, some mild or stronger forms of violence? Of course, and mild forms of violence lead to more, less mild. I realize that. Now, let me ask you this, however. Uh, I, have the students on most of the campuses who uh, who really want and I think deserve radical change in the their role uh, on the campus and in uh, the decision making process uh, do you think that these students have really begun to mobilize their power and their numbers and their unity to any degree comparable to those who believe in violence like the SDS. It seems to me that, that there are ways of mobilizing students to, to bring about desirable changes that, that the students haven't really touched yet. I, I, I don't know. I ask. Uh, yeah, I, I'm quite certain. It, it's, it's a matter of what you do. You have, you have certain people who feel strongly about something, so you, you, you work on it. I know that. Let, let, have, let me ask you another question, because I want to get your view on this. Have we got another minute? Uh, Take this ROTC thing. Uh, why, should, why should one group of students decide or want to prevent another group of students from taking ROTC if they want to? And furthermore, isn't it, uh, and I, I raise this question for information, isn't it 
or at least to examine the merit of, of the argument, isn't it, is, if we're not going to disband uh, uh, an officer corps uh, in our military establishment, and I, that seems unlikely, isn't it better that future officers of the armed services should to some degree get some of their tra training in what we hope is the civilizing environment of a university campus? Isn't it better for our military that they be, that there be university ROTCs? I asked the question. And yeah, I answered the two questions. Okay. Oh, it was about uh, keeping others from taking out to see if they want to. I, I can answer that with a confusing question to you. Shouldn't students be allowed to kill each other because one, one student wants to kill somebody else? Oh, you don't believe that's um, analogous. No, the, the, the <clears throat> and, and, <laughs> let me finish. Um, in, in response to your second one, I think right. I can make more articulate. Certainly, slide. certainly. I think you're going to have certain, there's going to have certain humanizing, if you, if you call it that, effect on your officers. But what the hell does having the military on the campus do to the campus in, in the inverse type of reaction? In other words, the military on the campus certainly is going to influence the type of education that the rest of the students get, the type of environment. Of course, I, I, the that's not true. Uh, oh, okay, this is a... Before SBS started all this, this malarkey, nobody even noticed our OGC on campus. Uh, <laughs> I must say that uh, I have been to the, uh, to the Army War College at, in Pennsylvania. Uh, they're mostly the upcoming colonels in the Army who will be the future top people in the armed forces. And I must say I, I was impressed by their civilized approach to affairs, by their awareness that there's more often a political answer to an pro international problem than a, than a military answer. Uh, I, incidentally, I found much stronger support for the foreign aid program in the War College in Pennsylvania than I found in Congress of the United States. Uh, I, 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 I'm just saying that from my experience, uh, 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 these, uh, these Potential young officers and those who get ahead, to, to me, I, I haven't met a General Walker and a thousand of them. Well, shall we stop? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.